So let's have a look at the reactive oxygen species. This is a really simple, lovely chart, even though I made it myself, <laughs> because um, I understand it. This is the point, and if I understand it, then I can teach it to you. If I don't understand it, it's very difficult to teach a subject if you don't really fully understand how it works. So I put down all the things which are of clinical significance to you. And that is what produces this uh, complex four, what produces superoxide. So superoxide is the first reactive oxygen species. It is a free radical because it's got an extra electron, so it means it's unstable. So normal mitochondrial oxidation. That means the normal production of energy at complex four will produce a certain percentage of superoxide. Nothing is ever 100% clean and efficient. Okay? Now some people will say it can be up as high as 5% of oxidative reactions in the body will produce superoxide. We may be more efficient than that, but if we do produce the superoxide, we've got to get rid of it. And the natural favoured pathway of getting rid of these reactive oxygen species is the enzymes. The enzymes are the natural way of reducing free radicals, okay? not antioxidants. Antioxidants are used when the enzymes don't work properly or they're overwhelmed. So taking more antioxidants in the body is not necessarily the answer. It may be necessary if you live in a very toxic environment. But the major pathway, the favoured pathway of reducing superoxide and hydrogen peroxide are the enzymes. Now, the reduction of superoxide to hydrogen peroxide is under the auspices of an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. And there's three different types of this. There's an iron, there's the more common zinc copper dependent one, and the manganese. So these elements, these minerals, may be essential to upregulate and optimize the production of superoxide to reduce superoxide to hydrogen peroxide. Now, hydrogen peroxide should then be reduced to water. And to do this, it needs an enzyme called catalase. Now, we found um, that you can get catalase from uh, pig's liver. Usually it's extracted from commercially. Uh, but there's two very good natural sources that the labs take it from. One is watermelon seeds. Very, very difficult to get these days. Have you notice whenever you eat watermelon in the restaurant in hotels, there's hardly any seeds. Uh, I think when we go to hotels, and go to the breakfast, it's the first thing we normally go to, and everybody looks at us because we take the watermelon with the seeds. Because <laughs> the seeds, when you chew the seeds, it's full of catalase. And we've learned that a good source of SOD is melon. It's ordinary melon, the uh, honeydew melon thing, is a good source of SOD. That means that the seeds of these plants are able to detoxify within the plant. That's why the plant produces this, for a reason. And so they're actually able to detoxify free radicals themselves, otherwise they wouldn't produce these enzymes. Why are certain plants rich in magnesium? Because they use magnesium for their structure. And so if a plant develops in itself SOD, it must be because it's trying to reduce superoxide in the process. So SOD is in ordinary melon, but it's in, um, mainly it's in horseradish. Okay, horseradish is great. So we need hydrogen peroxide at times, don't we? to kill parasites. And one of the biggest sources of parasites is fish, particularly raw fish. <laughs> okay, So what you have is the wasabi, horseradish, to stimulate the production of hydrogen peroxide. If you do not have the horseradish with raw fish, then you're asking for trouble because your immune system won't be able to kill the parasites. And a lot of people who develop parasites uh, are because they have raw fish. Dogs are very prone to this. You know, dogs won't have horseradish normally, but if they have raw fish, then you're in trouble because most raw fish have parasites. If you look carefully at them, they contain the cysts, mainly the cestodes in there. So the only way you can treat that is to freeze the fish first. So if you have sushi, you should always have it frozen before it's served, okay? And that kills the parasites, okay? If it's not, if it's fresh fish, then the chances are any fresh fish, if you look carefully enough, has got parasites in it. You've just got to look carefully enough and you'll see them in there. So horseradish is, mu is a must for stimulating hydrogen peroxide. So this is why you have horseradish with roast beef. Same thing, if you have rare roast beef, which most of us like now, you must have horseradish with it. 
If you don't, then you stand a chance that the parasite eggs and things in there will hatch inside you. So there's reason why they invented, if you like, the combinations of horseradish uh, with beef and wasabi with sushi. Okay, so hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is reduced to water and requires catalase. And that's in watermelon. Uh, but the other thing that's in, and it's used a lot in school experiments, chemistry, is potato. It's very high in potato, and it's in the water of potato, not in the starch. So if you juice potato, it's very rich, the juice of potato. What's left in the vegetable extractor, the juicer, is starch. So that whitey stuff, which is there, is starch. But the juice is very rich in protein, and in there is catalase, amongst many other substances. How do they know? Because every school child can tell you, you have a flask, a little flask to test you with hydrogen peroxide in it, and you pour potato water into it, and it bubbles. And that bubble is oxygen. So the hydrogen peroxide is being reduced to oxygen. Okay? So what's left in the bottom of the tube is water, okay? plus, of course, the residue of the potato. But the catalase acts as the reducer to convert hydrogen peroxide to water and gives off oxygen. So potato, fresh potato, is a very, very good source of catalase. But all enzymes, of course, are destroyed in heating. So as soon as you heat it above body temperature, probably about 40, I don't know for sure, 40, 45 degrees, you'll kill the enzyme. So the potato, therefore, has to be taken raw. Okay, so all those who wanted baked potatoes today will not get the benefit of catalase. You get the benefit of the starch, but not the catalase. It has to be a raw potato, and it's got to be juiced. All right? Now, this might be all right, but if you're a green person, body constitution, you're also potentially going to get solanine foods in there, solanine extracts in there. So this may not be good for you, but potato water is actually one of the richest sources of many proteins. Potato actually has a lot of protein, but not the starch bit. So you get rid of the starch by juicing it. But it's also very beneficial as a detoxifier of free radicals. Now, following on from that, second to catalase is glutathione peroxidase, which is that other selenium-dependent enzyme that I talked about. So glutathione peroxidase is involved with the oxidation reduction of glutathione as an antioxidant. So glutathione is the principal intracellular antioxidant in the body. So if you don't do this, you, you're losing your antioxidant ability to detoxify hydrogen peroxide and you're getting a buildup of toxins which would normally be conjugated or linked to glutathione. So this person who would be deficient here would be chemically sensitive. They can't detoxify. So this is the nightmare patient who becomes sensitive to almost everything, you know, apart from Tibetan grass. <laughs> you know, they, they eat this, oh, I'm ill, I'm so ill, you know, and you say, oh, forget it, you know, oh, I can't touch this, I can't use this cream. So we make creams which have nothing really in it at all. And some of these people even react to those. So they say, oh, I can't take that. And you think, well, this person's putting it on. They're not putting it on. They're just chemically loaded right up from environmental chemicals right up to the top and over the top. But very small amounts push them over the top and they would get reactions to it. But so you, by taking it down and down and down, so this is glutathione peroxidase, or a lack of this, which is a selenium-dependent enzyme. You know, you know, when you're little older, you remember back um, to your childhood in your earlier days in practice in the 1970s, we never had people chemically sensitive. It was quite rare to have some, oh, I've had an allergy to something. Uh, oh, you've been stung by stinging nettles or something like that. But people weren't reactive in the way they reacted now. Kids never had eczema. You know, it was quite unusual. You had a few kids in school who got asthma, but they were lucky because they got off games and things. <laughs> but you didn't have eczema, really, and uh, certainly a lot of these skin problems. But you certainly didn't get hypersensitivity. Now, this all came in the 80s, didn't it? In the 80s and the 90s, it got worse and worse and worse. People get multiple chemical sensitivities, that it's called, because they just don't know what to do with it. And I remember listening to a, a talk that George Goodhart gave. He had a patient, um, this must have been back in the 80s or 90s, who was so chemically sensitive to everything and allergic to all these foods. And the whole thing was cured or kept under control. The chap just took one thing, and that was selenium. And George didn't know why. He just said, well, carry on taking the selenium is the treatment. You know, but nobody really knew why it actually kept this guy. He could tolerate the Western world, you know, life in it, by taking the selenium. 
And of course, now we know what the reason for that is, is because it's the main cofactor for glutathione peroxidase enzyme. So he, this guy was actually able to detoxify. And you'll find that glutathione is the prime intracellular detoxifier. Okay, and then we've got other peroxidasing enzymes, NADH peroxidase and other peroxidase enzymes. So these all do the same thing. They reduce hydrogen peroxide to water. Now, hydrogen peroxide can be side shunted here with the halogens, particularly chlorine, bromine, and iodine, into hyperchlorite, hyperbromite, hypoiodite. These are um, reactive oxygen species. They have an extra electron on there, on there, particularly the chlorine. And this is called Clorox or bleach, we would call this. Okay? It's house, basically household bleach. And we use household bleach to kill 99% of all known germs, except it doesn't kill 99% of all known germs. It kills very effectively gram-positives, bacteria, and a number of viruses. And interesting, probably kills a lot of tumors. Not that I'm suggesting you drink household bleach to do that. But what we want to do is to make our own bodies to do that. And to stimulate that chlorine, chloride added onto there from hydrogen peroxide, there's an enzyme called myeloperoxidase. So this is a really, really important enzyme in our immune system for fighting infections and tumors. So when our white cells upregulate, in other words, they increase their metabolic rate, and they do this very simply, by the body having a higher temperature. This is why we get a temperature. So when we get an infection, we increase from 37 to 38 to 39, which stimulates myeloperoxidase enzyme to be produced, and it's called the respiratory burst. So we start to build up the rate of respiration in our white cells, so we produce more free radicals. Because we want free radicals when we've got an infection, because that's how the main way the white cells non-specifically kill the microbes. Now, every molecule of a xenobiotic, xeno means strange, so every molecule of a toxic substance, a strange substance of the body, has to be detoxified. If it's not a natural substance of the body, we have to pee it out or poo it out through the liver and the feces. So phase one detoxification adds an OH to make the substance more water soluble, and then we conjugate it with glutathione or sulfur or acetylation to pass it out. Phase one detoxification is primarily for fat-soluble toxins. So this would be hormonal-like substances, pesticides, herbicides, things that get lodged in our fat if we don't detoxify them. We would store them for a rainy day if they don't kill us before. So this is what happens with the fish. So the fish stores dioxin. doesn't kill the fish just pops it in its fat. And we know that the fat is liquidy in a fish to keep the fish nice and flexible. And when you eat that oily fish, as we're all told to do, we're also eating all the toxins that it's absorbed. It doesn't kill it. Fish is fine, but we won't, might not be. So if you're sensitive to certain chemicals, certain toxic metals like mercury, and then you shouldn't eat fish oil. Okay? And these are mainly the blue constitutional people. The greens can eat it and the reds can eat it, but blues are deadly with mercury and dioxins and things, and should therefore not, never, never, never eat fish oil, no matter how much they claim it's clean. There is no such thing as clean. They claim, claim it's clean with containing none, but if you ask them for the certificate of analysis, it'll tell you less than so many million parts, uh, so, many, so many parts per million. Okay? Now, if you're a blue and you can't detoxify, even parts per million, every one of those will stay in you. Okay, a good example of this is DDT, isn't it? Well, there were 100,000 tonnies, I think it was, of DDT manufactured in the 60s and 50s and 60s. There is exactly 100,000 tonnies still, because it's non-degradable. And where is it? It's in you and you and you and me, and the, it's all in us, because we can't detoxify. Okay? So there are certain things which we're unable to detoxify, which are bio undegradable, uh, and it depends upon your metabolic type or your constitutional body type. So, myeloperoxidase. So the respiratory burst increases our body temperature, which stimulates the white cells to produce more free radicals and stimulates myeloperoxidase. Phase two detoxification is the ability to detoxify a toxin substance, but every molecule of that toxic substance produces one molecule of superoxide. 
So therefore, the more toxic the environment that you're in, the greater number of free radicals you produce. Okay, so you're increasing your load of free radical production or oxidative hits to your cells, the more toxic the environment. Which is why, if you go to a toxic environment, you see people look older. That's the first thing you notice. Some years, 20 years ago perhaps now, I had a group of Russian doctors who came over. Uh, you remember probably Gail, you were around at that time. And um, they were amazed at my patients because they said, uh, this guy is 80? And I said, yes. He said, but he doesn't look 80. <laughs> I said, well, he's 80, I'm sorry. He said, well, people look 80 when they're 60 in Russia, or, or earlier. People age much quicker. And uh, you tend to sort of, oh, it's the bad weather. You know? But the weather's not bad in Russia. You know, it's cold in the winter and lovely in the summer. But it's the pollution. The pollution was so high back in the 90s, and certainly in the communist era. And it's the pollution equates with increased free radical production increase, it equates with the aging process. So you, it's very difficult for them to take protection from the environment when you're getting benzopyrene and all the other awful chemicals that you're breathing in 24-7. So this would include all drugs. All drugs have to be detoxified in the body. You know, the drug is a drug because it's a poison. Okay, it's a, it's a toxin. Okay? Um, everybody thinks of drugs as being medicines. Medicines are poisons. Okay? That's how they work. They work to inhibit an enzyme from functioning. If you want to relieve pain, you take something which stops your brain from hearing pain. Okay? So all drugs are, pain, are, are, are poisons. It's just a matter of how much you take. This is why they all have, don't exceed the dose. Okay? Uh, aspirin or any simple antidepressant, painkillers, etc., are taken in milligrams. Okay? It's the active ingredient. That's enough to inhibit so that your symptoms are subsided while you're taking the drug. If you take more than that, you could be ill. And if you take more than that again, you could die. Okay? And people do die, they do it on purpose, don't they? They take an overdose. So that everybody knows <laughs> that a high dose can kill you. Okay? The trouble is, what is a high dose for you and a high dose for me? We may not know until you've taken it. So people, nobody knows whether you're going to react to a medication until you've taken it and see whether you do react to it. Okay? And if you die, you react it. And if you get ill, you react it. Don't take so much is the answer. Okay? But ideally, the answer obviously is to get to the cause of what the problem is. Because the medication is not designed to heal you or to correct the problem. It's designed to hide the symptoms. So it's very spectacular because it can take the pain away within minutes, you know, take that. But it won't detoxify you if it's a toxin or you've got an infection uh, or you've got a bad neck and that's creating a headache. You've got to get to the cause really, haven't you? But it, it, pharmaceutical medicine is great for first aid, you know? Uh, and in some cases, it's great for long term if the person has a serious problem, but not at the expense of trying to correct their health. So the fourth reason we produce reactive oxidases is hypoxia. And this is the most common reason, is a lack of oxygen actually delivered to complex four in the first place. So if you haven't got enough oxygen there, you then got more electrons being fired out and no oxygen to receive these. Okay, so you're going to build up your electrons and that causes the damage. So those are the four major reasons we call, we, we, we develop uh, reactive oxygen species. Now, we get to hydrogen peroxide here, we reduce this with catalase. If we don't reduce it with catalase, glutathione, etc., what will happen in the presence of iron and copper, because free iron and copper have two valencies. Uh, iron has a valency of two and three, and copper of one and two. Uh, these will stimulate the production of a third electron, which will be added to hydrogen peroxide and reduce this to hydroxyl radical, which will nick both sides of the DNA and do a lot of damage. So we've now got superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radical water. So that by adding one electron at a time, well, this is our uh, issue of why we have these, okay? So the first one electron is superoxide, two is hydrogen peroxide, three is hydroxyl, fourth one is water and oxygen. If we add a halogen, we develop then myeloperoxidase. If we add uh, hydrogen peroxide and chloride together, hypochloride together, we get singlet oxygen, which is an, uh, an oxygen with an electron on an even outer unstable orbit. But we have a second variety of reactive oxygen species, often called reactive nitrogen species, 
which are derived from the amino acid arginine in the urea cycle here by an enzyme called inducible nitric oxide synthase, which produces a reactive oxygen species called nitric oxide. Now this is a vasodilator, a powerful vasodilator, which is important when we've got infections to bring more blood to the area, but itself, by inducible nitric is, is produced from by um, various bacteria, and this is mainly used for killing gram-negative bacteria and some viruses, uh, and I believe some fungi. So this is more for certain bacteria, more the gram-negatives, this is more for gram-positives. Both will react on viruses, um, but nitric oxide, when it comes across superoxide, uh, non-enzymatically, the two will convert or connect together and produce peroxynitrite, which can inter interrelate with hydroxyl radical, although in its own right is a very, probably the highest reactive oxygen species that is present. So peroxynitrite will do more damage and inflammation to the cell structure than any other reactive oxygen species. So we call it the dreaded peroxynitrite. And this tends to be produced only in circumstances when there's a resistant uh, bacteria, but more commonly viruses and fungi. So hydrogen peroxide does the parasites, superoxide, hypochloride, nitric oxide do more the bacteria, and peroxynitrite more the resistant things like funguses and some, some uh, viruses. So that's the, um, the family. Okay, now I've underlined the enzymes here, specific enzymes here, for one reason, and that these are heme-dependent enzymes. These enzymes are made from heme. And heme, as we'll see when we do about hypoxia, is this substance which goes on to make substances like hemoglobin, but goes on to make all the cytochromes in the body, which are all light-sensitive. So as we see when we look at hypoxia, if we have the abnormal intermediate substances in the making of heme, we end up with these intermediate substances which are very sensitive to light and make people very sensitive to light, called porphyrins. Now, anything which is a heme-dependent enzyme is sensitive to light. And this is normal mitochondria oxidation because the cytochrome C's in the mitochondria. The phase one detoxification known as cytochrome P450 enzyme, cytochrome B450, myeloperoxidase, catalase, so the most important uh, reducer of hydrogen peroxide and other peroxidizing enzymes are heme dependent and nitric oxide synthase that makes nitric oxide. This means that if they're heme and they're sensitive to light, we can use light therapeutically. It means that we can give a good light to these people and it will stimulate the enzymes. So giving a therapeutic light, or so color, wave band, will stimulate the immune system. Now they're doing a lot of research at the moment of 460, 470 nanometers with treating acne. So they found very effective of using LAD banks of light with killing off the bacteria which are involved with acne with people in the skin by shining a blue light on them. There's a lot of research when you start looking into it of using mainly in the blue spectrum, the blue end of there, for killing all sorts of bacteria and viruses. So this may well be the future because as antibiotics begin to fade in their use and the bacteria become more resistant, they may actually be sensitive to one thing, and that's to light. But they're more sensitive not themselves to light, it's just that the enzymes that we've been given are sensitive to light and can be induced or upregulated, because all these enzymes are inducible, in other words, they can be turned on, if you know the right light. And if you do your muscle testing, it's quite easy to determine which is the color or the shade of color which negates the problem. So the future may well be just not only looking at the nutrients to help the person not regulate their detoxification, give them silver, etc., to fight the infection, but the color may become one of the most important therapies that the person can have. So by using light through the various acetates which we produced, which cover the different wavelengths, we may be able to stimulate myeloperoxidase, specifically, because there's probably a wavelength for that, but probably a different wavelength for that one. So you can do, choose it for the person, of what it is that they require. So that just summarizes what each one kills there. So challenge for energy. Weak muscle strengthens to ATP, as I said before, 
and a strong muscle weakens to ADP. So I need now to demonstrate this, and we need somebody who is tired. Okay, so let's take you as you're tired. So which side would you like to be? Batting? Okay, so we need ATP. So normally what we would do is a workup with a person, where we would check that they have the constitutional color, that they would weaken to red, green, and blue. Uh, they'd be balanced on left and right with the subconscious emotions. Their body clock was in time, etc. So that'd be the normal sort of preliminary. So pull your knee to your shoulder. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start off with um, a, uh, a marker called ADP. So ADP is like a discharged battery, like an old rechargeable battery which is discharged. So we're going to pop that on uh, to see if she says, how do you like a bit more discharge? So she weakens to ADP. Now, we need something, could be a muscle individually, could be a color we could use as a, as a marker. Um, we could do that um, for the uh, colors here. You're red, aren't you? So let's try the red acetate there. So anything that changes are pretty universal to weakness, which is fine, and now we'll put ATP on. Remember, these markers are magnesium ATP, magnesium ADP. This is what the body actually uses. So we're now going to put magnesium ATP. And she strengthens, which proves that she's got a high level of ADP and a low level of ATP, right? Okay. You're tired. It's official. Okay, so when you moan, oh, I feel so tired, you're right, you are. Okay. What we don't know at this stage is how tired she is. We could do a verbal challenge and say out of 100, etc., etc., your metabolic rate, etc. So what we're going to do is now see if we can diagnose where in the pathway she is. So let's remember glycolysis. So the end product of glycolysis is pyruvic, pyruvate or pyruvic acid. Okay? So let's test her with that. I'm looking to see if she strengthens to pyruvate. No. All right. So the first pathway, glycolysis, is all right. So now let's see acetyl CoA. So we're going to take oxidize. Uh, we're going to reduce the uh, oxidize rather the um, uh, pyruvate across the uh, membrane, the outer membrane to the inner membrane. And ooh, we're in luck. She strengthens to acetyl CoA. Okay. That means we got a block in getting the pyruvate across to acetyl CoA. So now we need pyruvate back again, because we would be getting a build-up relatively of pyruvate, wouldn't we? So if we get a high level of pyruvate, um, when we're not converting it, we should normally go weak. Yes, so this is relative, all right? So she's got a high pyruvate and a lower level of acetyl. So that's where her block is. And you remember immediately, ah, oh, that's where the B1 works, isn't it? Could be B2, B3, B5, but let's go for that. So before we do that, if she builds up pyruvate, what happens to it? Do you remember it goes sideways into lactic acid? That's it. So what we want is lactic acid. And you should find in that box, pain is it pain diagnostic or is it one of the other ones? I think it might be in one of the other boxes, um, the hypoxic, the, the, the one. Have we got the... Anyway, what happens is that she will weaken to one of the forms of lactic acid. And there's three forms of lactic acid. There's the D, the L, and the DL form. They're just isomers of the same substance. But it does appear that it corresponds to the body types. So that blue tend to get genetically a higher level of the D, and the red people get the DL, and the, blue, and the green people get the L. We don't have that at the moment. Okay. So do you get aches and pains? Do you tire when you get aches and pains when you tire? Because when she's working more anaerobically at this stage, isn't she? Because she's not metabolizing uh, pyruvate, so it'll shunt sideways. So she may develop pain on exercise much quicker than what she should be. She may get all sorts of pains. And when, when the lactic acid builds up, these are people who are sensitive in their muscles, because it builds up in the muscles. They're the people you just touch, and they go, oh! And you say, well, hold, hold on, I haven't touched you, really. It's only just gently. They're very, very sensitive because they've got this build-up of lactic acid. Lactic acid, remember, sensitizes the nociceptors, which increases the level of pain. 
but it doesn't drive the inflammatory process, but it sensitizes the nose septum. So what we want to now do now is we want to put the pyruvate on, which is the substance which weakens, and then we want to go through the cofactors and coenzymes to get that to work. So the first one is we'll go for thiamine pyrophosphate, because that's the substance that actually does that dehydrogenation process. So let's put thiamine pyrophosphate. So she strengthens the thiamine pyrophosphate. So the question now is, is she deficient in thiamine, or can she not get thiamine to activate into thiamine pyrophosphate? In other words, should she take thiamine or thiamine pyrophosphate? That's the question. So now what we're going to do is why we put, we do products with thiamine, just on the arm, and we do products with thiamine pyrophosphate. So now let's put th th thiamine, that's thiamine. So what we do is now she strengthens to thiamine. This means that she's short of thiamine. So there's no point in giving her thiamine pyrophosphate because she can probably make her own thiamine pyrophosphate provided she's given enough thiamine. Where do we get thiamine from? Bread. Okay. Cereal, whole grain cereals is the common thing. Do you eat wheat? No. no. We're on to a losing battle here, aren't we? Okay. Do you eat liver? No. no. Okay. So offal is the second biggest uh, supplier of it. So there's no bread and no offal. <laughs> okay. Okay. Will you eat spelt? Or will you eat camels? Yes. yes. Try it. Try it because I think if you if you get freshly ground camel or freshly ground wheat, you will not get a reaction to it. Okay. We haven't had yet had a reaction to somebody who's had fresh ground whole grain wheat or spelt. Nobody yet. We we're yet to find somebody who reacts to. It. Plenty of people react to flour and plenty of people react to bread. Bread's got other things in it. And plenty of people react to flour because it can be weeks, months, or even years old by the time it's used. So it's stale, it's gone rancid, all the oils have gone over. If it's freshly ground and made into bread, you don't have the problem. If you use camel wheat, which is what I described earlier, it's a simple form, it's got half the chromosomes in one wheat, and it's much more digestible because it hasn't got all those different types of proteins for you to try and absorb. I think we'll get the, the thiamine up. Now at the moment we've got a thiamine, I think we've got a thiamine as a capsule, and a thiamine as a liquid, don't we? So we need one to do the dose for you. What we're going to do is we're going to go... Um, we haven't got the capsule, but we've, we've perhaps got the liquid, which is all right. So we can do a liquid for you. Now, it's a pity that you were such a disappointment to me that you strengthen so quickly, because I was hoping I could get into the mitochondria with you. Uh, so we'll need another volunteer after lunch. Uh, just to say, if we go for the liquid, uh, I've got a glass already on it, yes. So what we do here, just to refresh us, is the liquid is, to some extent, is a better way of taking the supplement, because we can dose it. We can say exactly um, the only amount of uh, thiamine that's going in, one squirt there is 12 drops. So we probably don't put drops in. You can put drops if you want it as a young child. But we'll say that's two squirts, which is 24 drops. And you can calculate it back from one drop equals a certain dose there. So we know that what we've got there is two squirts strengthens you up. Okay? So I'm going to take one squirt out. It's the greatest advantage of liquids. And I put half a squirt back in. So we'll go to one and a half squirts now. So now it's definitely two squirts seems to be the optimal. So we'll just pop that back in there. Okay. And then what we want to know is, that's the dose, but how many times a day should she take it? <coughs> it is a vitamin, and therefore you should get it from your weight and your liver. Okay. So you hold that on there. I'm just going to cross therapy localize with her to the stomach meridian. That's between the xiphoid and the umbilicus. She stays nice and strong. That's breakfast time. Stomach meridian, 7 till 9 or 8 till 10 at the moment. Then we're going to go on small intestine time, which is 1 o'clock till 3 or 2 to 4 at the moment. So this is lunch time. And she goes back into weakness. That's not a good time to give it. So now let's go to circulation sex time, which is 7 till 9 or 8 till 10 as it is in summer saving time. 
So of the three meals of the day, she only stays strong on one of those, which is breakfast time, which is very convenient, because most people remember to take their supplements at breakfast time. People often forget in the evening time, it's very difficult, I can have a supplement in front of me, in, Stuart will put it in front of my plate, and I still will forget to take it. And we'll go to bed and say, ah, I didn't take my whatever it is, oils or whatever. And lunchtime you can forget for most people, it's very, very difficult to remember lunchtime. Very difficult for some reason. But luckily, food supplements should be taken at food time. And for you, it's breakfast time. Right? Should she take it uh, before 8 o'clock? No. Okay, if you get up earlier and you have your breakfast before 8, then it's not as efficient as between 8 and 10. Right? So it may be that you take the bottle in your handbag and take it to work or whatever, because that's the optimal time. If we put you in large intestine time, which is before 8 o'clock at the moment, is be 6 to 8, it doesn't get used, okay? It's, it's giving a negative result. So in other words, it's not giving a positive, it won't get into the system, because the biological rhythms of the body are every two-hour cycles. So this is why we have two-hour cycles, why we feel hungry at breakfast time, because that's the time when you absorb your nutrients and when you utilize them. If you take them at a different time, you won't absorb them in the same way. You'll get them in, but they won't get working, okay? So, two squirts at breakfast time.